You ever get a song stuck in your mind? <laughs> this land is your land. As I was reading this, this land is my land from uh, well, California, but in this case, <laughs> from Canaan to the, anyway, to the river Euphrates, you know, on and on you can go, right? Um, but I get that stuck in my head and I thought, you know what, that really makes a lot of sense. But the thing about it is, is we oftentimes forget about this, about this particular uh, move of God, the children of the promised land. And, and, and I want to talk about that today a little bit. This land is your land. And we're going to talk about our Canaan land, our promised land. Amen? So let's pray. Father in heaven, I thank you for uh, the blessing of all the message we've heard in our Sunday school hour and in our uh, song service. And I pray, Lord, that you will uh, do a work as only you can do. We pray for souls to be saved, lives to be changed. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, at this point, we know that the children of Israel are now out of Egypt. So that's pretty clear. Uh, the deliverance of Israel from Egypt is a picture of our salvation. We're slaves in bondage to sin. The, the, the toughest master you're ever going to serve. Uh, sin will take us further than we ever wanted to go. It's going to make us pay more dearly than we ever thought we would pay. But the thing about it is, is now they're on the edge of this thing called the promised land. The promised land is before them. So Moses... Uh, while he was still alive, he sends out 12 spies. Everybody remember that? So they all come back with a story. Ten of the spies come back with a negative story. Two spies came back and says, I don't know who your God is, but our God says that's our land. Amen? And so they now say, uh, they're, the, the negative people said, listen, they, they, you know, it's great, it's beautiful, just like God said, but there are huge giants everywhere. We look like grasshoppers next to them. The cities have walls so wide you can ride chariots on top. That's pretty wide. But then the minority report, Joshua and, Ca and Caleb was their names. Uh, they said, uh, we see giants, but we also see God. Amen. Pretty amazing. Amen? Now, the, uh, the people decided to follow, of course, the naysayers. And where is that going to get you? When you follow the, na the naysayers, where does that get you? It gets you nowhere. The children of Israel now have turned an 11-day journey into 40 years. Boy, that's a, that's a big difference, wouldn't you think? Well, they turn around in circles over and over and over again. So just like they're being in, in, in uh, slave, they're freed from slavery in Israel... Or sorry, in Egypt, that pictures our salvation. Wandering the wilderness also pictures our Christian life as well. You see, sometimes we go nowhere. So I said, so I'm saved, praise God, but are you living in victory? Are you living in the victory that God wants to give you? No. Are you maturing? No. Maybe you're just coasting through life. You got your fire insurance policy in hand. Amen. You're, you're a perpetual baby. You don't move from milk to meat. Uh, you only cry out to Dada when something goes wrong. Amen? Forty years later, when that rebellious generation died off, a new generation is marched into the promised land. And they possessed it. And this land was called Canaan. Canaan. They were claiming their Canaan. Now, Canaan is a picture of a victorious Christian life. And my question to you today, as you sit in that chair where you're at, are you living a victorious Christian life? Now, it's interesting because some say this is, uh, this is a picture, it's analogous of, of, of heaven and entering the promised land. No, it's not. You see, because Moses was not allowed to go to the promised land. But we know that Moses is in heaven today. Everybody understand that? So it's not about going to heaven. This is about <clears throat> living and claiming your Canaan. Now, the life of victory is not a life of perfection. It is a life of growth. It is a life of growing and maturing in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I ask you again, are you living a victorious life? Are you living victorious in your life? Every person today 
is in one of three locations. Number one, you're in Egypt. You're in Egypt and you're still in slavery to sin and you need to be saved. I'm here to tell you folks, uh, there are a lot more folks that are not saved in the church today than you can imagine. As a matter of fact, Billy Graham was famous for saying, he says roughly 70% uh, of church members are not saved. I thought, well, that's a big percentage. You see, because we come to church, we believe in God, but we never establish the relationship with God that we need. Well, that's the first one. The second one, you're in the wilderness. You're saved, but you're going nowhere. You're just going in circles in your Christian walk. You're, you're not much closer to God than you were the day you got saved. You see, maybe you're still not making commitments to be faithful to God. One thing I hear a lot in the world, and especially in the church world, there's folks that say, boy, it's difficult to get people to commit. Anybody ever heard that? It is difficult to get people to commit. I want to tell you something. That is not new with the world today. Getting people to commit is difficult to do. And the only reason that people commit is because they have that life in Christ that's victorious. And they love Him for what He's done. And they want to serve Him because of it. Well, the third place we can be is in Canaan. You're excited. You're growing. You're a giant conqueror. Amen? Hello? <laughs> You're not a wilderness wanderer. That's hard to say. Wilderness wanderer. Say that ten times real fast. The thing about it is, is where are you at today? You know, churches also have, uh, <clears throat> have three locations. The same for churches. Um, churches can be in Egypt. Uh, Egypt churches do not preach salvation by grace. It's like the blind leading the blind. More of a social club than a church. Terry uh, just finished up on Sunday night on the Universal uni, the uni, the Unitarian Universalist Church. They don't believe anything. That's really the bottom line. They get together and and they talk about science and they talk about things and they they tell each other how you know they just love each other, right? Because love is at the base. But what's so interesting is they allow atheists, agnostics, people of all faiths. You say, Brother Don, what's wrong with that? Really? The thing about it is, is that that's the way the world is today. I'm okay. You're okay. We're all okay. Right? And you hear it more and more in the world today. The Bible is very clear in the end times. They will not listen to sound doctrine. They will call right wrong and wrong right. Amen. And we see that in the world today. We see that in our country today. And today we have a lot of social club churches that are out and about. You say, Brother Don, which ones? Listen, I'm not here to call out churches. I'm just here to tell you we've got a problem. Well, then there's the wilderness churches. They have saved people, but they're going nowhere but in circles. They go through the motions. In other words, they're busy about the business of God, but they have forgotten the God of the business. They've left their first love. They don't do it because they love God anymore. They just do it because they're, that's what they've always done. You ever heard that in a church before? We can't do it that way. We've always done it this way. See, here's the thing. <laughs> sure, there's sin in the church, but nobody's perfect. Somebody might say, I hate to think what's going on in the privacy of many members' homes. But let's not talk about that. Let's dress up, shake hands, have parties, eat. Thank God we're saved and not like this world that's going to hell in a handbasket. And that's what you get. You get that kind of attitude in some churches. But we also have the Canaan churches where you walk through the door and you can feel the spirit of excitement. 
The expectancy is in the air. The church is growing. Decisions are many. There's pleasure to, sh to serve, to give, and to work together as a team. To hold each other accountable. Boy, be careful of that word. Amen? And be glad to be held accountable. Friends, they're not only encouraged, but also challenged, convicted. They're humble enough to confess, and they make things right. Going forward, they'll climb uphill. They'll swim upstream. It's a victorious church. Amen? Now, of the three, which do you want to be a part of? Friends, I don't want to look back years after I've been saved and find out I've just been going in circles. Now, there's times in my life when I have. I'm sure there's times in many people's lives that we feel like we've gone in circles. But I pray that it's not many laps around the pool. Amen? I would hate to see a, 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 a big gully where I've worn out a place going in circles in my Christian walk. Let me circle around once or twice, learn my lesson, and then move on for God. Friends, in our text, Moses' job is done, and he, he, he dies. And the Lord selects uh, Joshua, and it's a new chapter, a new era to begin, and a new generation is asked to step up to the plate and do their part. But like here. Here's the thing. Can I tell you something? We have some of the best senior adults I can ever imagine. Our senior adults here at this church are just fantastic. I love you. But I'm here to tell you, if you're relying on them to continue to give all the giving, give all the work, and, and, and on and on it goes, I'm going to tell you something. Their tank's almost on empty. Amen? God's about ready to call them home. Hello? Well, isn't that depressing? But I'm here to tell you, church, it is the next generation that needs to pick up the mantle Amen. and carry it forward. Now, I'm not a senior adult. I look like one with my hair, but I'm not. But the thing about it is, is even I'm not getting any younger. And I want to tell you, senior adults, how are we investing our lives in those that are coming up behind you? Are we so busy making sure it's just right? Are we so busy in doing the work of God that we have failed to bring up that next generation to take the mantle. Chapter shows us three principles that are necessities, I believe, to claiming Canaan, to having that victory. Number one is preparation. Preparation. In verse 11, it says victuals. There's the word victuals. That's, that means victuals or food. Amen? They're getting ready to cross the swollen Jordan River. In chapter 3, says that at this time of year, the Jordan was overflowing its banks. So you'd think Joshua would have had to prepare a bridge or a boat, but instead he said, let's make lunch. That's what he said. You must have proper nourishment. Did you, you ever hear the phrase, an army travels on its stomach? Absolutely. Friends, a hungry soldier will not fight well. They needed a diet change. You say, what do you mean? They've had manna for 40 years. The only thing manna was supposed to do was sustain them for 11 days until they made their journey. But ever since they decided not to do what God asked, he said, go to the promised land. Eh, God, I think we're okay back here. He says, okay, then manna is what you get. 40 years. Can you imagine eating the same thing for 40 years? Now, friends, I like a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, but I don't think I'd eat one every day for 40 years. Now, I've seen people eat stuff. They'll put them on the news, but they're more rare than you imagine. You know, man eats McDonald's for 30 years straight. <laughs> Number one, ew. <laughs> but number two, double oo. Amen. That's just nasty. <laughs> Nobody ever came home to ask what was for supper. 
You know, get people come home. Your kids will come home. I, I get. I do this with Bobby sometimes, I, and, and I hate. And I hate that I do it sometimes. I've gotten. Such, I said, "Hey, uh, what's for supper?" <laughs> That's why I post on Facebook, hey, Grandpa, what's for supper? So I put Grandpa, what, I talk to Grandpa. Everybody says, are you Grandpa? I better not be. <laughs> or wherever my children are today. Not for a while yet. But you see, some here lived through the Great Depression. You had three meals a day. Oatmeal for breakfast, cornmeal for lunch, and no meal for supper. Amen. And some of us today complain because we didn't get the right hamburger or the right whatever. Friends, again, they are, they are going to the land uh, flowing with milk and honey. Manna was just supposed to be a heavenly appetizer. Amen? <laughs> it was only supposed to be an appetizer meal. Anybody ever eat an appetizer? My mother, my mother will eat an appetizer for supper. She doesn't eat much anymore. She'll buy you know, a little, little something. Oh, I, I, I'm, I'm full. But oh my, when the dessert plate rolls around, <laughs> this big massive chocolate mountain of something. My dad and I look at her and we say, I thought you were full. Well, that was for that. <laughs> what happened when, when I was a kid? That never happened. Just say it. Friends, if we're going to claim the promised land of Canaan, we're going to have to change our diet and start feeding on God's Word. It's a feast that God has set before us, but we all go week after week without it, and we act like we're not hungry. And today, some are going to push away from this message, and they're going to say, eh, that's just not for me, right? You go to some restaurants, and you say, eh, that's just not for me, right? But the thing about it is, is when we go long enough without it, we have starved our spiritual selves. What I give you at church on Sundays is only supposed to be an appetizer. Kind of heavenly hors d'oeuvres, so to speak. And that's to whet your appetite for what's coming next. And what comes next is based on what you do next. The Bible says to study to show yourself approved. A, a workman. Right out of God. And here's the thing. How much study are we doing? Instead of feasting on the Word, we fill up on all these other things, the junk foods of the world, TV shows. I mean, people schedule their life around the TV show. Oh, I got hey, is our TV show on? <laughs> I don't, and by the way, it's not mine anyway. I didn't buy it. We get addicted to computers and TVs and sometimes we get addicted to phones and video games. All sorts of activities as long as they aren't the things of God. Brother Don, is it bad to watch TV? Sometimes. Be careful what you watch. Be careful how much you bring in. Because garbage in is always garbage out. Amen? What about video games? They're not bad. I use video games to relax. Somebody says, I can't believe you play video games. I do. You know what that does? That helps my mind, ADHD as it is, to come away from the, the stresses and the worries of what takes place during a day. And I can just focus intensely on that. And they have to be a puzzle game. I just can't go around wandering around. What do you call it? The... I don't even know what they call it. You, you match colors and stuff. Jewelry, jeweler, jewelers, jewel. The the jewel. That's the word, isn't it? The jewel. Is that a game? That's it. Or some game? No, Candy Crush. That's what it is. It's on the TV with those crazy critters. Do you know what it's like to get a free power up? <laughs> nope. <laughs> and now I don't want one because I don't want a psycho cat riding a motorcycle through my house. Amen. <laughs> It's garbage in, garbage out. We've got to change our diet. We stuff ourselves full of things that aren't good for us. We're deceived into thinking we're satisfied, but it's only temporary, and we're back out searching for more. 
See, that's what the world's doing too. Even the lost people of the world especially, they're looking for more. And the world fills them up. But it's only temporary. And then they are hungry again. We're losing our children as a result. And you'll notice after they graduate, they miss from church largely because of this. They're a missing demographic in church. God, by the way, I want to explain something to you here in just a minute. God gave his children seven feasts to observe. We're going to study them in the future. But I want to tell you, the feasts were, in, uh, were not, they did not partake of the feast in the wilderness only when they got into Canaan. Does anybody know why? These feasts were meant as celebrations. There wasn't nothing to celebrate out in, the, out in the wilderness, amen? Imagine a father in the wilderness deciding he wanted to keep the feast of the Lord and all he has is manna. He's sitting on a hot rock, leaning against a cactus trying to feast. His son says, what are you doing? I'm celebrating God's blessings on us. Can't you sell? Son scratches his head thinking, man, all we've got is dusty manna. We're thirsty and I'm tired of it. We have nothing to celebrate. I'm going back to Egypt. And that's what happens when we, we circle around in our Christian lives. We think there's nothing more to it. I'm going back to Egypt. At least we had leeks and all that good stuff. Until they beat you for not making the right number of bricks. But don't, don't, you know, don't worry about that. A mom and a dad who really live their life and walk the walk throughout the week. It's worth a library full of arguments over rules and curfews. Anybody ever, ever heard this? Maybe from your own parents. Don't do as I do. Do as I say. You've immediately given your children a reason not to live for Christ. So let's apply it to church. If this church gets built up and blessed, it's not because of my funny jokes and my uncommonly good looks. <laughs> and that's especially true since I'm running out of both at a rapid rate. <laughs> Friends, my job is to lead and feed. Your job is to swallow and follow. Amen? Where are you at? Are you still in Egypt? Do you need salvation? Wandering in wilderness? Need direction? March forward and claim your Canaan. Riding the fence between uh, Egypt and the promised land is a miserable place to be. And we've already noticed that, right? Children of Israel weren't happy. You've got enough of the world still in you that you can't enjoy Jesus. But you've got enough, in, enough Jesus in you that you can't enjoy the world. And you're stuck. Man was missing a lot at church and the pastor went to see him. He explained, I'll tell you why I don't come. It's all this rain. It just rains every day. <laughs> Pastor said, well, it's dry in church. And the man said, yeah, that's another reason why I don't come. <laughs> You'll catch on in a minute. <laughs> Friends, the wilderness is dry. It's a dusty experience. But the good news is the land of milk and honey is not far away at all. So three principles. Number one, preparation. Number two, power. Three days. Verse 11 talks about three days. In three days, that equals resurrection power. Resurrection power. Just as Jonah came out of the belly of the great fish, or the mammal, or something, Jesus came forth from the dead after three days. Abraham took Isaac to the mountain to sacrifice him, but they both returned alive after three days. So I think coincidence, it's not a coincidence that Joshua said we're making a move in our three days. We're going to go in God's power. And that made me think, living victorious is not your responsibility. It's your response to God's ability. It's not your responsibility, but it's how you respond to God's ability. <laughs> Philippians 3.10 says that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection. I want to tell you, even more monumental than the creation of earth was the rising, was the raising of Jesus from the dead. 
Because now what that has said is God has raised Jesus. He was the first fruit. And that's going to happen to every one of us that have accepted Christ. And what an amazing power that is. That we will rise from the grave. Amen? Amen. Amen. If we want to live victoriously, there's going to be giants. And they're going to face and walk in our cities. But we don't have to face them alone. We can't face them alone. Now, I have a little illustration for you. Uh, this is the robe I typically, or one like it, I typically wear <coughs> for uh, baptisms. And, uh, ooh, it smells so, so fresh. <laughs> All right, anyway. Um, so this is what I wear. So I'm going to lay this right over here. And I thought, if anything should have the power to do something, surely it's a baptismal robe. Amen. So let's talk to the robe. Hello, robe. Would you go pick up my Bible and wave it in the air? It's like my kids. <laughs> hey, 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 baptismal robe. Would you go up there and baptize somebody? Hmm. Why won't it go? I like this room. Amen. The more I wear it, the more I like it. Amen. <laughs> this one doesn't feel like mine. <laughs> It's not you see my arms. But it still fits. Thank you. So now, with this robe, look, I can pick up the Bible. I can baptize somebody. I can wave my hands in the air and say, Hallelujah. But what's the difference? What made the difference? Anybody know? Because I was in it. In order for this robe to have any power to do anything, I gotta be in it. And the same goes for you. In order for you to have power to do anything, God has to be in you. And when we don't follow up and we don't study his word and we don't live in victory. That's all the good we are. With God working in us and through us, we can do anything. That's why Philippians 4.13 is there. I can do all things through Christ with strength of me. Let God fill you and use you and give you victory. Amen? Maybe it's a financial giant. Don't fight it alone. Fight it with God. Maybe it's a giant of health. Maybe it's some, that, that, whatever your giant. Conquer it with God. Resurrection power. After three days, we're making our move. Finally, third, possession. We need preparation, we need power, we need possession. This was land on the wrong side of the Jordan. And some of the tribes were actually enamored with it. Some of the tribes say, I think we're going to stay right here. That's southern talk for right here, right? <laughs> Friends, this wasn't the promised land. It was fertile, it was nice, it was close to the river, but it wasn't what God had given to them. But God let them have what they wanted so much. God has done amazing things in our church, friends. Amen. I can look around. Can you believe I can, that we can look around? And, and how many of you, let me ask you this. How many of you have been a member of this church for two years or less? Raise your hand. Look around, friends. Amen. Put your hands down. See what God has done. Amen. Many people have been saved coming to church. Friends, we don't proselyte you from another church. 
Hey, if you can't make it in another church, you, you're liable not to make it here. Amen? But we'll love you. We'll bring you in. Amen? God is up to something. But I think it's just a taste. I think where we are right now as a church is just on this side of the Jordan. I think we're seeing the fertileness. I think we're seeing good, oh, we're seeing good stuff. We baptize people at this church. Folks are being saved. Lives are being changed and transformed. And we praise God for that because without Him, it would be nothing here. But do you wish this is all we had? Now we may say no. We like it like this. We like hugging necks and taking 15 minutes to do our, our handshaking when we're only given two, right? <laughs> we love the celebrations. We love what we love to eat. Amen? <laughs> but the thing about it is, I believe this is just a touch. You ready to claim your Canaan land? You ready to take that one last step of faith? Joshua reminded them since they made their choice, they were going to get what they wanted. And that's the fourth category that needs to be added to our choices. Not just Egypt, the wilderness, and Canaan, but now a not quite category. These are the East Siders. And no, they're not moving on up. Amen. As a matter of fact, they took a step down from what God had for them. Even in good Canaan land churches like ours, sometimes the separation takes place much like in Joshua 1. Some become satisfied staying just like they are and don't appreciate the accountability and the challenge to rise above. They look out the windows to others beckoning them to come and join them and enjoy freedom they feel they have found. And then there's a group who found a vision and wants to go forward for Christ. And then the two groups decide to drift apart. See, East Siders settle for less than God's best. They may have marched a football all the way down the field, but they allow the devil's goal line stand to keep them out. With the promised land in sight, they give up and are shut down just inches away from victory. It's easy for Christians to get into a comfort zone and never reach the end zone. After all, we're better off than we were when we were in Egypt or in the wilderness. And that's good enough. See, God's best is not just good enough. God's best is far better than anything we could ever imagine. And I want God's best. Don't you? <laughs> Some people might say, I'm not on fire for God, but I'm not exactly living in sin either. The Bible calls that lukewarmness. By the way, we're not supposed to compare ourselves to the world or to one another, but to Christ. Friends, you're as close to God as you want to be. No one's holding you back. You're the master of your faith, spiritually speaking. And so now my question is this, are you going to be an east sider? Or an end zoner. Amen. Are you ready to take that next step? So where are you at today? Number one. Today is the day to make sure that you have your salvation where it needs to be. The rich fullness of life in Christ can never be compared to anything else. Do you have that relationship? Do you need to be saved? Do you need to come in the invitation? Number two, maybe you're a wanderer, right? I was laughing. Terry and I, I think we were laughing last week. Um, Indiana, I live in Kentucky, Anna, which is uh, Louisville, but I lived some in Indiana. And uh, they had this, this, this great motto, huh? Wander Indiana. Yeah. Wander Indiana, wander, wander Indiana, Indiana. <laughs> no. <laughs> I've wandered north of Indianapolis. It gets real boring after that. Amen. But the thing about it is, is 
Maybe you're wandering around and you're frustrated and you're tired of it. Friends, you can come to this altar and get that right. Boy, say, man, I'm ready for the promised land. Maybe you're living in victory, but you know someone that's not. You need to come. And today, would you commit to either being an east sider or an end zoner? Which would it be? Let's pray. Father in heaven, I thank you.